Hello, my name is Tara McGowan, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the World Kamishibai Forum online. As many of you know, Kamishibai, or paper theater, developed in Japan in the 1930s as a popular street performance art. Kamishibai storytellers traveled by bicycle from neighborhood to neighborhood, selling candy and other treats, and telling children exciting stories. Kamishibai became so popular that when television came to Japan in the 1950s, people called it Denki Kamishibai, or Electric Kamishibai. If you look at a Kamishibai stage, or butai, you can see why people thought it was similar to a TV screen. But with Kamishibai, there is always a live storyteller standing next to the stage, animating the pictures with dramatic sound effects, dialogue, and the movement of the cards. Award-winning author and illustrator, Alan Say, who grew up in Japan, published his picture book, Kamishibai Man, in 2005, based on his memories of the street performance artists. He thought that Kamishibai had died out when television came to Japan. When he found out through a mutual friend that I was offering Kamishibai workshops at Coatsen Children's Library at Princeton University in New Jersey, he was so surprised he called me out of the blue. He wanted to know how I had learned about Kamishibai, and he even asked me to write the afterword, A Brief History of Kamishibai. What Alan Say didn't know is that there are artists and educators around the world who are discovering Kamishibai and using it in community centers, schools, libraries, museums, and other venues to entertain and educate children and adults and to inspire them to create their own stories and to perform for each other. With its connections to the history of film and other visual popular culture from Japan, like manga and anime, Kamishibai has been attracting interest from outside Japan for many years now. That enthusiasm and interest has recently been re-imported to Japan. In fact, there is a whole new generation of young street performance artists who organize annual festivals in Japan in the summer. There are also a growing number of tezukuri or handmade kamishibai festivals where people of all ages create and perform their own stories for each other in annual festivals throughout Japan. The purpose of the World Kamishibai Forum is to celebrate the diversity of performance styles that have developed in Japan and across the globe so that we may learn from each other about this vibrant art form. The World Kamishibai Forum will be presenting a series of mini workshop videos that will be released every other week from September until June with presenters from all different countries. Each presenter will address what attracted them to Kamishibai, what audiences they share Kamishibai stories with and where, and finally, tips for performing and creating Kamishibai for storytellers, teachers, and homeschooling parents, as so many parents are in the current COVID pandemic. In coordination with the videos, we will be offering a series of webinars once a month to give presenters an opportunity to answer questions. Everyone who has watched the videos will have an opportunity to register for the webinars and submit questions prior to or during the moderated discussions. To start off the series, I would like to begin by briefly modeling what we are asking the presenters to do in their videos by answering the question, what was it that first attracted me to coming to buy? As a visual artist and storyteller, working in public schools in New Jersey and yeah. teaching in Japanese at a Japanese language school, I became fascinated by visual storytelling. In the late 1990s, I met Margaret Eisenstadt and Donna Tamaki of Kamishibai for Kids in New York. Thanks to them, I was able to go to Japan and meet Egoro Futamata, Kazuko Ute, and many other well-known kamishibai performers and illustrators in Japan, including our first four presenters for this forum. 
Utai sensei took me to a tezukuri or handmade kamishibai festival in Mino near Osaka, where I saw performers from the ages of three to 83, all sharing their own original kamishibai stories with each other. I was hooked. After that, I went back to Japan many times to take part in these festivals and to meet new artists and storytellers. Based on what I learned, I wrote my first book, The Kamishibai Classroom, Engaging Multiple Literacies Through the Art of Paper Theater, which provides hands-on techniques for teachers to use in their classrooms to teach literacy through kamishibai performance. As I learned more about the history of kamishibai, I realized that it was very closely connected to the history of early magic lantern shows or silent film. In fact, the first kamishibai, which was called Tachie, or standing pictures, was based on the animation that was made possible by magic lantern slides. Here I have a couple of Tachie, or early kamishibai puppets, based on ones from around 1920. Here we have a monster wolf about to attack the famous ninja, Sarutobi Sasuke. When the wolf attacks quickly, Sarutobi Sasuke slashes him with his sword. Of course, with this kind of animation, ghost stories were particularly popular. Here, I have an example of a Tachie puppet of a beautiful woman who, when I turn the puppet very quickly, turns into a rokurokubi, or long-necked ghost. Around 1930, when the hirae, or this kind of kamishibai that we are familiar with today, was developed, you can see where there are similar kinds of um, techniques were possible. Here, we have a famous shapeshifter from Japanese folklore, the tanuki. And if I pull the card very quickly, he turns into what we call a Totsume kozo, or a one-eyed ghost. So you can see where this new form of kamishibai was adapted from the earlier form. But this hirae, or flat picture form of kamishibai, was also closer to silent film. Movies in Japan were never really silent because there was always a movie narrator or storyteller sitting alongside the film explaining the movie to listeners. These benshi, or movie narrators, as they were called, became so popular that they were almost more popular than the stars in the films. So the street performance artists who developed this kind of kamishibai were often emulating the benshi, or movie narrators, of silent films. When I teach students how to make kamishibai, I often will tell them that they are the directors of their own miniature movie. In the 20 years since I started my research, Kamishibai has taken off in so many interesting directions around the globe. My second book, Performing Kamishibai, an emerging new literacy for a global audience, looks at this renewed interest in Kamishibai and demonstrates how Kamishibai provides concrete methods of teaching many of the new literacies that are required of young people today. With new technology, we are increasingly able to mix written, oral, visual, moving images, gesture into one communication. What better way to develop all of those skills than by performing a kamishibai story before a live audience? Both of my books about kamishibai focus on creating stories with young people and helping them to develop their ideas through live performance. I also do a lot of programming in schools, museums, and libraries using kamishibai to teach about different aspects of Japanese culture. When I returned to the U.S. after having studied about kamishibai in Japan, I had to adapt what I had learned to an American audience who was unfamiliar with kamishibai. As I just demonstrated, kamishibai is a form of animation so imagining a dramatic movement from in the transition from one card to another is a new experience for most American students. One of the unique features of kamishibai is that it makes the audience naturally curious to want to know what will appear when the performer pulls the card. For instance, with this story I created 
to teach American students about kamishibai, we have a giant snake who travels over the land and over the sea. One day, he suddenly sees a snake that looks just like him. Maybe it's a rival snake. What do you think he does? Kaboom! He bites down on it, only to discover that he had traveled all around the world and bitten his own tail. This story also demonstrates how zooming in on the climax of the story and then panning out again allows you to have a very different perspective on the world. In this way, the Kamishibai format naturally teaches students who perform their own stories how to build suspense into the story structure as they transition from one card to the next. The tip I would like to share with everyone today comes out of my experience studying with the Japanese artist and illustrator Kyoko Watanabe. Her illustrations for Nyaon, the kitten, a kamishibai story published by Doshinsha inspired me to use her story as a model for visual storytelling when working with students. Kamishibai is a form of theater. So the text and instructions printed on the back of published kamishibai cards is usually referred to as the kyakuhon or script. Here you can see how the script is written on the back of the nyaon cards. Thanks to Kamishibai for Kids and Donna Tamaki, many of these cards are also available for purchase with English scripts on the back. This makes Kamishibai easy for anyone to perform, whether you have a background in performance or not. What gives Kamishibai its broad appeal is that it can be as simple or as complicated as you want to make it. Nyaon is a simple story about a kitten who thinks she can catch the moon. But Watanabe-sensei added visual complexity to it by giving us a sense of perspective. When the audience is positioned behind the main character, in this case, Nyaon, we see the world through Nyaon's eyes. And she continues this throughout the story. Nyaon! As Nyaon chases after the moon, as you can see from my visual mapping of the story, Watanabe-sensei builds suspense by the way she has the audience follow Nyaon through her various efforts to catch the moon. She gradually builds these attempts up to the climax. Notice that she zooms in on the climax, suddenly bringing her audience face to face with Nyaon. Zooming in on the climax of the story is a visual technique to be found in many kamishibai stories because it effectively pulls the audience into the story at the most exciting part. In this case, just when Nyaon catches the moon in a puddle. The use of zooming in at the climax and positioning the audience behind the main character so that they can see the story from the main character's perspective are techniques that I used in my adaptation of a Vietnamese folktale, How Dragons Came to Be, one of the stories I created when I was studying with Watanabe-sensei. As you watch me perform the story, notice that I also emulate Watanabe-sensei's way of coming in on each scene from a different camera angle to keep the story visually exciting. In cinema, it is often said that the eyes tire before the ear. And this is true of kamishibai as well. By varying the camera angles, zooming in and panning out in some of the techniques I've just showed you, you keep your story visually exciting for your audience. This is a pourquoi story I chose to do in the kamishibai format because it explains several visual phenomena. How dragons came to be. No, hajimari, hajimari. Oh, mukashi, a long, long time ago, when the earth was just young, 
The emperor of the heavens looked down and he was worried. The rain god was making as much rain as he could, but even so, the earth was drying up. Soon the animals and the people would be suffering. He had to do something. Then he had an idea. He called all the creatures of the oceans and the waters together and he said to them, I will send out three heavenly waves. And if any one of you can ride those waves up to my palace in the heavens, that creature will I make the first dragon. Well, the animals were all excited, as you can imagine. A dragon, a dragon, what is a dragon? They all wanted to know. Why, a dragon, said the emperor. It's the most powerful creature of them all. When the rain god calls on the dragon, she will fly up to the heavens from out of the ocean and scatter life-giving rain over the earth. Well, of course, all the creatures of the oceans wanted to be the first dragon. And almost all of them tried and failed. There were only a few creatures left. One of them was the porgy. Now the porgy was a very excitable fish. And so when the first wave came coming, he got more and more nervous. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? He went right through the first wave instead of riding it up to the heavens and he landed in the trough below. Suddenly the second wave picked him up in the air. My head is spinning and threw him into the clouds. He landed back down on the crest of the third wave and crashed down to the ocean floor. Well, the porgy had failed, but the emperor of the heavens was so proud of him for trying that he placed his fingers on both sides of the porgy's flank. And that is why today, when you see a silver porgy, you'll notice they have spots on either side of them. When the tiny shrimp saw that the porgy had been so honored, she wanted to try. She was very light on her feet and she was sure she could do it. I'm going to be the first dragon. I'm going to be the first dragon. She got so excited she started to dance and so when the second wave came, oh no, she slipped off the top of it into the ocean floor and boom, down crashed the wave on top of it. Poor shrimp. That is why when you go to supermarkets today, you'll notice that the shrimp's back is broken. Now, all the creatures of the ocean had tried, but none of the river fish or freshwater fish had. They weren't used to the big ocean waves. But the emperor of the heavens got angry and tired of waiting. Goro, 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 pita, pita, he sent down thunder and lightning and finally, shivering with fear, the carp swam forward. She knew she was the most powerful of the river fish. When the first wave came, she clung to it as tight as she could, but barely managed to hold on as it rose up to the heavens. When the second wave came, oh, she pushed herself into the wave, but this time it was so tight around her. Oh, my ribs are breaking. With the third wave, she knew what to do. She pushed herself up on top of the wave, climbing higher and higher and higher into the heavens until in the distance, look what she saw, the palace of the emperor himself. Well, you would think at this point, she would be excited. She was almost at her destination. But when she thought about how high she was above the ocean, if she were to drop from here, she would die for sure. She closed her eyes tight as she could. But instead of falling, she landed on a smooth, hard surface. And when she opened her eyes, she saw that it was the floor of the palace and above her, the emperor of the heavens himself was standing and waving his hand. And suddenly, from out of her own tail sprang a much longer tail. Out of her sides came strong, powerful arms and claws and her nose grew longer and sharp fangs grew out of her mouth. 
just as the emperor had promised. She had become the world's first dragon. If you look at Asian dragons today, you'll notice that they were once carp. They have the big carp-like eyes. They often have carp-like whiskers. And they have the rainbow-like scales all along their flanks. And that is why the carp is revered throughout Asia as a strong and powerful fish that became the first dragon so that we have enough rain on Earth. Oh, see, my, the end. This is a story I often use for programs I do on Children's Day. Carp windsocks can be seen flying above the rooftops of many houses in Japan for Children's Day in May because parents want their children to grow up strong and resilient like the carp. As you may have noticed, I use the technique of positioning the audience behind the carp as it rises up to the heavens and sees the palace of the emperor of the heavens beyond. And I zoom in on the carp as it transforms into the first dragon. Incorporating visual storytelling techniques like these that naturally build suspense into the story instills in students a concrete understanding of story structure that they can then translate into their writing. One fun follow-up exercise to do with a story like this is to have children imagine either through illustration, illustrating a kamishibai story or writing, what might have happened had a different creature become the first dragon, say a swordfish or an octopus. Over the two decades that I've been researching and creating Kamishibai, I've met so many interesting and creative storytellers and artists in Japan and around the world. I've been invited to international Kamishibai festivals in Mexico, Slovenia, and Peru. And now with the COVID crisis, there are so many new ways that Kamishibai is being shared online. The first of our four storytellers in our World Kamishibai Forum series are from Japan. The first two presenters in the series, Fumiko Araki, known as Bunchan, and Noma Shigeyuki, known as Nomarin, will focus on bringing Kamishibai to life through performance. Bunchan is also a well known author of Kamishibai stories in Japan. In our first webinar, we will discuss the theme of different performance styles in Japan and how to make kamishibai entertaining as well as educational. After that, we will have two well-known illustrators of kamishibai offer workshops on developing stories visually. Stay tuned as our series takes us around the globe from Japan to South America, Mexico to the US, Slovenia to Australia. Kamishibai is a living art form that will continue to evolve in new directions as long as there are creative people who love to make and listen to great stories. Of course, this series of presenters just begins to scratch the surface. We know there are a lot of talented people around the world today who are doing exciting things with Kamishibai. If you or someone you know is making kamishibai an important part of their practice and taking it in new directions, please let us know. We hope that this World Kamishibai Forum will be the first of many such series in the years ahead. Please help us celebrate the diversity of kamishibai around the globe. Mm -hmm.